All right, I think I got all the bugs worked out here. And let me adjust the audio. I'm telling this is an adventure and a half, but um, let me know if you guys are seeing and hearing properly because sometimes there are problems. Yeah, so um, good evening and welcome to the live stream. And um, it's nice to see you all here tonight. We do this every Sunday, 9.30 and here on this channel. And of course, if you like the content, you know, be sure, be sure to make sure that you're subscribed and hit the like button. This way you can get much more content. I'm trying to post a little more often during the holidays and we have um, a good few topics. So, you know, vloggers do vlogmas and such like that. I'm doing radio miss, right? I'm doing something where I'm actually doing ham radio related videos. So maybe you got a little break during the holidays and you're kind of just figuring out, well, you know, I, I want to learn ham radio a little more. Right, so um, tonight, uh, this audio is a little hot. Yeah, so tonight we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to relate some of my personal journey in amateur radio and use that as a teaching tool to tell you what you can do in the radio hobby and what you can get involved in. Because I've been involved in a lot of things. So, uh, but first, I noticed some interesting questions here. And I'm going to... Um, pop out this chat and see if I can turn on my live comments. Right. And just uno momento. And then I will see here. And then I do um, comments. I have this nifty little comments module that I use with OBS. And it's actually pretty, um, pretty interesting. You know. And... I can just bear with me one moment here. So it actually works like, um, and then it's complaining about keyframes again. I don't know. So, um, anyway. All right. So, um, I want to highlight this comment and show you guys something here. Is that an anti light bulb shirt? Okay. And is that an anti light bulb shirt? by Ed, WD8KCT, okay? The story of that shirt is quite interesting. So that shirt was given to me by Otis in Puerto Rico. Um, and what the hams in Puerto Rico, obviously they face problems with their very neglected power grid, right? So their power grid in Puerto Rico is very neglected and the power company has been doing lots of problems of course hurricane maria really did a number on them in terms of their power during the 2018 uh, cq worldwide cw contest morse code contest or is it sorry awrldx i'm sorry awrldx contest the puerto rican hams as a form of protest so in a contest, those of you who don't know, the contest, you actually send a piece of information to, you know, to make a contact. You know, you don't want to just send call signs and copy and say 5-9, everybody 5-9. No. What you do is you, um, you want to send a piece of information. So in the case of the ARLDX, you send either your U.S. state, right, or if you're overseas, and Puerto Rico counts as a DX entity, you send your power in watts. So what the Puerto Rican hams did was they decided that they're going to send the number zero as a protest to say, hey, guys, we don't have any power, you know, and um, that raised quite a stir on the contest reflectors. And then, you know, of course, you have guys saying, Oh, you know, they, they shouldn't make no protests or nothing. They even liken it to Colin Kaepernick taking a knee, which is kind of <laughs> okay. But um, you know what? The guys in Puerto Rico, they had a valid protest because, you know, their, um, their power company really were not doing them any favors. I actually, you know, during my, um, and it's interesting because 
you know, EcoFlow just launched their Delta Pro. And actually, they have them at Costco now if you want to get them. Um, that's not an affiliate anything, by the way. Okay, I don't make anything from the Costco sales. But if you go to Costco.com, you will see that how they have the EcoFlow Delta Pro there. And even the River Pro is really good price there. Of course, they have their other sales on for Christmas and such like that. Now, they're big Christmas sales. I might have um, affiliate links for those. And I might have discount coupons and such like that if you guys want. But anyway... Um, so I've been getting a lot of interest from Puerto Rico. So back to the shirt, right? The shirt, basically, Otis sent me the shirt because I piped up in the contest. I said, guys, these guys have a valid point. You know, they're, um, they're suffering the power. And, you know, it's like um, they want to be heard. And then the, you know, uh, people, of course, decided to jump on me. I do not shy away from any controversy in amateur radio ever. Okay? If it's one thing people know about me, I do not ever shy away from controversies in amateur radio. And I always believe in sticking up for what I believe is right. Okay? And I believe that these Puerto Rican hams had a, um, had a good point to get across. Okay? So, Otis saw that. NP4G and he sent me the shirt and then he sent me a note that said thank you um, you truly understand what's going on and you know we'd like to present you with this shirt I wore it at Dayton I have a picture of myself and Otis in Dayton and um, it was Xenia okay Hamvention but they call it Dayton Hamvention for some odd reason because I guess Xenia Hamvention doesn't roll off the tongue and that's the story of the shirt. So, you know, thanks for asking. So that's a good icebreaker for tonight. You see? And Ed was saying that. Okay. Cool beans. All righty. So let's jump into tonight's topic. And, um... Huh. I did? Okay. Whatever. I do block trolls because I find that it's not it's pointless arguing with trolls. But anyway, um, okay. Uh, oh, I blocked you. Or uh, okay, let me guess. You're like one of these people who are like trolling about YouTube influencers. Look, I just blocked them because I didn't want people tagging me and all sorts of stuff. Okay, um, that wasn't a controversy. That was just a troll being a troll. Okay, and I don't care. But anyway, um, right, so tonight we're going to talk about what I, you know, some of the things you can do. So let's start out with what got me into amateur radio. I didn't get into amateur radio to DX. I didn't get into do contesting at all. I didn't get into do rag shoes. I didn't get into do any of traditional amateur radio activities. I got in because I like the tech, and I'll tell you some of the things that got me in that influenced me there. Shortwave listening. My dad was an SWL, and um, you know, he kind of I kind of listened too, and I liked that. And then, you know, I I I heard you could get QSL cards from them, um, but you know, it's like I um, I eventually picked that up as a hobby. Okay, I got I got quite a few interesting QSL cards I got from HCJB in Ecuador. Of course, a lot of the ham radio, um, ham radio, not ham radio. The, a lot of shortwave broadcasts are Christian stations, so you know they have a lot of um, they have a lot of outreach and stuff like that. So um, yeah, they kind of you know I got into that. I got from HCJB. I got from Radio Ukraine International, and the, the really interesting about Radio Ukraine International, which used to be Radio Kiev, but actually they changed it to Radio Ukraine, because this was after the, the breakup of the Soviet Union. What they did was um, the local post office, or I don't know if it was the United States or whoever, because sometimes these things go through third countries before it reaches us. I was in Trinidad at that time. The envelope was sliced open. Somebody wanted to inspect it. You know, uh, they're probably saying, why are you getting email from the former Soviet Union? Why not email? Why are you getting mail from the former Soviet Union? 
Well, I listen to them on the radio. And to be honest, the shortwaves are open and they broadcast. So guess what? I'm listening. And they actually send me a, a lot of nice things. What inspired me for that is my dad had a friend to, who used to get things from uh, these shortwave radio stations. He got like from the Voice of America. He got like a cloth pennant he had hanging up in his shortwave shack and other stuff. My uncle was a cb -er. I never found appeal in the CB culture. I mean, you know, I'm not against CB radio when it's done in a way that doesn't diminish the enjoyment of others. But, um, you know, and that doesn't necessarily, you know, I don't, I don't care if you, I do care, okay, if you break the law and break the rules or whatever. But um, it doesn't bother me if it affects only yourself, right? When it begins to affect others, like example, you're ripping up the neighbor's TV and I get blamed because my antennas are more visible, that's when I get a problem, okay? Or if, um, you know, or if you splatter and interfere with my stuff, that's when I care. So um, my uncle was a cb -er. He had a Moonraker 4. He had a Cobra 148 in his car, which was a Toyota Crown car. It was like, you know, an executive sedan kind of thing. He was, he had a hardware store and, he, you know, he was well off. Then, um, he had CB radios in his trucks, in his hardware store trucks, and he used that to communicate. You know, when they went to the warehouse, they would call back and, you know, report on stock they had there and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, it was, it, that was kind of it, but really wasn't too much of it. The CB scene kind of died off in Trinidad when we when we got phones, when everybody got telephones, and then later on in the 90s when everybody got cell phones. So we got cell phone service in, I think, it was 1996 or something. But, um, and we had analog cell phones, which were fun to listen to, by the way, okay? And statute of limitations, guys. Okay, so um, the... <laughs> Yeah, so that, that kind of played a, a little bit of a part. And, um, you know, CB was always illegal in Trinidad, by the way. I don't think we had any license. I think only now they're beginning to regularize CB radio. So, you know, it's kind of like... Um, thing. Yeah, Carlisle, let me tell you something about this Toyota Crown. You, you're going to love it. It's right-hand drive, okay? And, um, you know, it, it was a Toyota... Toyota Crown, I think it was called uh, Cressy. It was like the 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 Royal Saloon, you know. So it, this was a real, real nice saloon. Um, for Americans, they, that's what what we call a sedan. Okay, so you call it a sedan, we call it a saloon, and it was right-hand drive. It was very nice. Um, let's see here. Uh, CB in yeah, CB in the 1960s. I think in general, you know, yeah, you could say that about a lot of things. You know, um, so, you know, I got you excited to hack stuff, okay? So let me tell you what got me into ham radio then, since we're progressing down that route. I enjoy building things. I enjoy soldering iron. I, I make a joke and say my first ever radio <laughs> was the soldering iron. I soldering iron, okay? And uh, I never forget, in an early video I made on this channel, some people chastise me for not saying soldering, you know, I'll have a cup of tea and I'm going to solder. But um, Americans, they say, we're going to solder that stuff, you know. <laughs> in, in New Jersey, they say, yeah, we're going to solder that stuff. So anyway, uh, I wanted to, to learn and experiment electronics in the worst way. And, um, you know, eventually I, I kind of like, you know, I didn't really have too much of a, a direction with that. I experimented all kind of circuits with, um, I built a wind speed anemometer because I was interested in nature and, and weather and stuff like that. We lived in a very rural area. Um, it was kind of rural, you know, but there is like oil fields and stuff like that. So I also got interested in, so back in Trinidad in the 19... 90s in 1991 well in 1990 we had a, a coup by a coup attempt so basically some you know some bad guys with a particular religion 
you could probably guess which one, decided that they wanted to take over the government. And they did for six days. So, you know, eventually they got out with amnesty. Uh, but uh, the president signed an amnesty, which was the stupidest thing ever. But I guess if, if, it, if, if that was, it, was what it took to end the siege, then more power to them. So anyway, um, and by the way, that led to the government banning CB radios. So the government basically didn't ban CB radios. They, they basically put, put the lockdown on all kinds of radio. And they said, you know, radio is a tool of this sort of um, anti-government sentiment and used to plan attacks. Okay, we're going to make sure that, you know, it's very heavily restricted. Talk about a sledgehammer to kill a fly. It's almost like some other thing I could think of. Don't you think of something that the government overreacts every time somebody uses it, you know, in an improper fashion? Gee, I wonder. Okay. Well, I will not comply. <laughs> um, that's a great podcast, by the way. Gun for Hire Radio. They, they're, they're really good. Anthony is a hoot. Um, so, yeah. So, I had the... Um, Women <laughs> sort of better than men. Mm, probably. But you know, there's like this old trope about these, you know, this one hole in the soldering iron, like it's chicken, like it smells like chicken, you know? So, um, long story short, I met up with um, a, a teacher in, in Trinidad, uh, Tony Lee Mack, 9Y4 Alpha Lima, and he was teaching ham radio, and, you know, he was also teaching English and music, and then Eventually, I, I, I got my license. You know, um, he sparked an interest. He used, to, he used to always be looking on the lookout for people to encourage in ham radio. I built so many circuits, right? I built some of the most oddball circuits. I built a circuit called, um, I built AM transmitters. I built FM transmitters. There was an outfit called Panaxis Productions which was really, you know, kind of like out there. They were really designed for the rebels, freedom of information kind of stuff, which is why I, I you know, I deal, I deal with, with that stuff, which is kind of like where that streak comes from, right? I've always believed in that kind of stuff and hacking and, you know, freaking and stuff like that. But um, they published plans for simple FM transmitters for, you know, pirate radio stations. I built a few of them for experimentation into a dummy load, of course. Statue of limitations. And um, I built AM transmitters. I built an AM transmitter using a triple five, a five, five, five timer. And this thing was really weird. Uh, the only problem was it produced so many harmonics. It was useless. But think of what you could do with a five, five, five timer. Because, you know, the 555, you're basically producing a square wave and then you're attempting to smooth it out. But um, this thing operated into the AM broadcast band, which was wild. It was a, it was a neat little novel little thing. But, um, yeah, so that's how I got into it. So after that initial experience in amateur radio, I actually got, um, I, was, I was a ham now, okay? I still enjoy shortwave listening, you know, um... The local activity in Trinidad is on two meter FM. Okay, so nearly every ham there gets on two meter FM. Not even seventy centimeter FM because there are few. There are so few people with the radios for that band, right? One and two. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have the coverage, right? So I have a video on this channel called VHF versus UHF. So, you know, you have two islands. You have Trinidad and Tobago. And VHF kind of covered them both, you know? We had two sets of repeaters. We had one in the central mountain range. And we had um, one in the northern mountain range. Later on, they added one in Tobago. Not only that, we would make contact with Venezuela sometimes, which was right off the the west coast. And the north coast, we could make contact into Grenada. We had a lot of Grenada. We had a few Grenadian hams checking into our nets. Um, most notably, I remember J39JT used to always check in, Julia 39, Julia Tango. And, um, you know, Grenada was kind of a special case because 
they used to actually receive their 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 um their television signals from Trinidad because they didn't have any any television stations there. So I started off with two meter FM. I had fun with that, and then you know talking with other hams in the local club, the local radio club. So they their local radio club, of course, it's a small country. There are only like two three hundred hams there now, and they kind of um. They had a lot of, um, you know, uh, people get together. And there are some people who really stick out in my mind. So you have Tech, T-E, Tempro, right? 9Y4LP. I think he's a silent key now because he's old when I was, you know. Um, so um, thanks, John. John, that's, that's a really nice compliment. I always like to make sure people learn something. But... Um, do I use ham radio in flying RC aircraft? I fly drones and there's, um, I use it, I could use it. I've tried out FPV and stuff like that. I want to get into FPV and I was told you could use long distance transmitters with um, FPV. My son is begging me to buy him. <laughs> um, he's begging me to buy him a commercial airliner. I'm just kidding. He's he's actually begging me to, um, to buy him a, um, uh, one of these um, model model 747s. I'm like, mm, that's all too much. But, you know, we'll see. But anyway, um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm all about the learning, by the way. So we did we did 2 meter FM. We did, um, and then I'm meeting with these hams from T-TARS. On the 2 meter repeaters, I would all be listening to Tech and Arnim 9x4AR. And Arnim and Tech, night, they... Literally, like how you're watching this live stream and I'm talking about tech and stuff like that. They would be deep into it for hours. And I'm sure they had a whole audience of people. Okay, listening. And they talked about a number of stuff. So tech, um, tech, I think, was retired from cable and wireless. And Arnim, I think, too, was war retired from cable and wireless. So those were the, the phone company which owned half of the local, almost half of the local phone company. And they would talk about everything from batteries and charging to antennas to grounding to even making a super heterodyne receiver with discarded components from a telephone exchange. It was, it was really fun listening to them. Of course, you know, as time marches on, the inevitable, inevitable occurs and, you know, as people say, um, yeah, I have people in this house. <laughs> Here's a hint. This is not my house. But anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, the, the, real, the real fun thing was I actually had a lot of, um, you know, books and stuff I used to read. And, you know, the bookstores used to say no free reading, okay? But you had to do it. You go in the bookstores and you see the book on the shelf. And maybe you might buy one. Okay. So I used to go and check out the books. And then uh, they used to have CQ Magazine. They didn't have QST because QST wasn't on the shelf. But QST was kind of, um, you know, um, my, my, my mentor, 9Y4AL, Tony, he was really, he had a membership in ARL and he used to let me read QST sometimes. So, interest number one, um, <laughs> yeah, 2,600, you know, um, yeah, Lucky225, um, yeah, he follows me on Twitter and I follow him, he's kind of, um, he's really interesting because he's in, of course, he used to be an editor for 2,600, I believe, and, um, you know, it was really, really, really fun um, watching some of the freaking stuff back in the days. I, sub I still subscribe to 2,600 some nice magazine so you got the boof wing okay nice <laughs> you got the boof wing good <laughs> yeah yeah jason's live stream is an hour look come watch mine it's better okay um <laughs> anyway um you could always be part of team replay i wouldn't feel offended but um and for those on team replay nice to have you here too so, yeah, so two meters actually, so what I'm saying is two meters actually got me interested in a lot of other things, right? And we have, um, 
Let's see here. Oh, we have 52 watching now. That's pretty good. Then we have other things I got interested. I learned about amateur fast scan television. I got plans to build. And I built a working transmitter, but I had nobody to talk to. You know, I use it, the cable ready VCR because we didn't have a cable ready TV. I use a cable ready VCR to receive the signal on, on ATV. And I made my transmitter. <coughs> excuse me. And it worked and worked real well. Other things I did were, um, so I finally got a kit transceiver on Morse code, right? And um, I got a, a kit transceiver for, on, for Morse code. The IERU actually sent these out to various people, and I got it with the deal was, you know, you could build it, use it, and when you're done, just give it back, okay? That I did. I had a lot of fun. Made a lot of Morse code contacts. Um, I got on loan a radio from a friend and I made contacts on single sideband and I was learning about things. I blew the finals out because the SWR was too high. This was one of those TS830 um, rigs. It kind of like arced and flashed over. So it was, you know, it was horrific. Um, and then I, I basically had a radio in my car and, you know, I used to spend my, my commute on two meters. Fast forward, I moved to the United States. So I moved to the US because back in 1986, my aunt, who just passed away the other day, God bless her, she um, she sponsored my mom and the rest of us. And, you know, it takes like 12 years, okay, for that kind of sponsorship. So she sponsored us, we came here, and then I came to New York because, you know, I wanted to do something different. And then um, I kind of figured that I would buy a, um, a radio. Of course, silly me, I went to Radio Shack because why not? They have the word radio in the name, okay? I bought this dinky little 300 milliwatt transceiver. I lived in the city at that time. I tried, I looked up repeaters. I tried to get on. Nah, that ain't working. Okay. Um, I, I went to a store recommended to me by my Elmer. <laughs> um, Ron, it's okay. You know, if you know I was on, that's okay. I'm usually on Sundays at 9.30. So, I usually have, um, I actually got uh, a Yesu VX5. And... I got that one because a lot of um, my friends in Trinidad knew about that radio. And I figured, you know what? I'm an American now. I'm making American money. Um, I could treat myself. So I got that one. And then I got a um, ICOM 746, which was another recommended one. But I got it from Barry Electronics. So um, I ended up paying, you know, too much money, I'm guessing. But Barry had some good stuff, you know, and I paid a New York City sales tax, too. So, um, with that, I actually started to learn a little more about amateur radio. I got involved with the local folks in the city, met up with them, and then, you know, uh, did some public service events. Then, uh, yeah, you know, I think he loves us. He just wants to... To, to stir up the hate, to, to pump the YouTube juice, like, you know, come on, okay? I, or maybe he just had a bad experience. I forgive him. I give him absolution, okay? So, um, <laughs> um he, um, <laughs> that was too much. But, um, All right, let me gather the thoughts again. Yeah, so I actually got involved with some public service events, and that opened a lot of new doors for me. You know, I began to learn about other things. Oh, I f there was one thing I forgot about in Trinidad. I have a friend in Trinidad, Irvin, 9Y4IBN, and Irvin had a number of different things. I mean, Irvin had a good station. He had a tri-bander beam on the backyard, and Irvin um, got me introduced to Winlink back then, they use the SCS PTC2 modem. And, you know, it was really, um, it was really interesting. And I actually saw the emails 
coming in the stations, checking in and retrieving the email. It was really fantastic. And the email, you know, the Winlink, he didn't have, we didn't have broadband back then. He had dial up. Yeah. So, you know, he would be connected to the internet like once or twice a day. The Winlink people would um, come and send their emails and then he would uh, connect to the internet and dial up. I helped him build an interface to connect his ICOM radio. Um, he he needed a level converter for uh, for the CI5 protocol on ICOM. So we got these ICs, the MAX 232 ICs, and then we built it on a breadboard and then put it up in a nice little case. And then, you know, he was able to have his radio auto scan. That was pretty interesting stuff. So anyway, in the U.S., I got my VX5 and I got my ICOM 746. Um, <clears throat> I had some good radio adventures, uh, I, but I did public service events with the VX5. Then, you know, some more religious guys decided to fly planes and, you know, in the city and it didn't work out well either. So, um, we had, you know, um, we had an incident here in, in, in September and, um, that kind of, um, I kind of didn't help, but, you know, we had a lot of ham radio stuff going on and, um, we had to go to, to schools as shelters and we had to deal with some of these people who were displaced from their homes and we had um, ham radio was in full effect. Of course, um, you know, the local folks kind of got ruffled by some of the the treatment, perceived treatment from the, the ARL and all of that stuff. So that really didn't sit well with them. Um, one thing I forgot to mention was when I tried to get a license in America, cause I was a new migrant, I didn't have a social security number and, um, legal one by the way. Okay. And then, um, cause they, you know, they take time to process your paperwork and such. They don't just greet you with a social security number at the airport, right? <laughs> as much as I'd like to have that happen. So. They, um, yeah, they sent me, uh, I went to a VE session in Brooklyn and then these guys, um, turned me away because I, so I actually looked at the form. I said, what do you put here? What do you said? Taxpayer ID number. They said, oh, you put your social. I'm like, well, I don't have one. They didn't send me one yet. They say, oh, well, you can't take the test. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And then they say, no, you can't take the test. I'm like, I, I hear the foreign people taking the test all the time. He said, no, you can't take that. So I got livid. I complained to the ARRL. I complained to the president back then was Jim Haney, W5JBP. And they threw their arms up in the air. You know, I was like, I'm telling you, I know some people get sour at the ARRL. I had my taste of it too. Okay. So I'm, I never say that the ARRL is perfect, but I think, um, you know, there's a lot to, to be improved. So I ended up um, getting that resolved. I got my social security number which is, you heard that? Yeah, good. Neither did I. But, um, <laughs> yeah, driving my 1963 security question. <laughs> um, the, um, they gave me, uh, the, then I got the test and I passed everything in one shot. Okay. So, um, that was, that was pretty interesting. So, yeah, so I got involved in a lot of activities and then I got involved in, um, you know, I want to get on HF because I had the 746 and the 746 does 100 watts on two meters. And um, the it does HF too. But in the city, it's horrendous. I mean, it's even bad on VHF, right? There's like so much terrible, terrible intermod and RF, you know, going from all different directions. I mean, powerful transmitters. You have the Empire State Building with, you know, all the, the radio stations and TV stations, you know, like all the New York City um, TV stations and the radio stations like Z100 and, and Light FM and all of them, you know, just pounding away. And then, of course, like the NYPD and, you know, everybody else. And I think cell phones were just making their, their big thing there. But... Um, but anyway, I hung a wire outside my uh, my window, and um, 
you know, hope with a small little fishing line sinker. I made contacts. The super didn't really catch me, so you know that's a good thing. Um, but I got I got interest in HF. The HF interest really did not pick up until I moved across the river to New Jersey. And people move to New Jersey. Yes, we do. Okay, I like I like some things about New Jersey. I don't like the taxes and the traffic and the congestion. But um, I live in Sussex County, which is is pretty nice and rural. But um, <clears throat> I do um, I actually contacted. So I was involved in the New York City Marathon as a radio operator, right? And Steve Mendelson was the um, W2ML, formerly WA2DHF, who was actually, at that time, I think he was the first vice president of AWRL. He used to be a division director, just like me. He used to have my job, okay? And, um, but he's also a, um, a, a sound engineer with ABC. So Steve really did a lot of um, interesting things. And then I told Steve, I say, hey, Steve, I'm moving to Jersey. You know, update my address for Marathon. He said, welcome, because he lived in Dumont, New Jersey. And then he said, why don't you try some local clubs? So he introduced me to Barra and the North Jersey DX Association. Well, I fi he said, um, if you like sorting QSL cards, why don't you try out the NJDXA? Okay, I figured that's cool. Let me go in, uh, to the North Jersey DX Association and sort some QSL cards because I like seeing cool QSL cards, right? Even the ones from Russia, okay, where you're going to buy them clothes for Christmas, okay? And not the not the not the bearded radio operators, you know, the ladies they have on the QSL cards. Maybe you buy them some clothes for Christmas. But anyway, I'm sure you guys got QSL cards like that, you know, <laughs> that 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 some guy who, you know, he's sorting cards and he's drinking his he's drinking from his Stoliknaya, you know, and um, Stoliknaya is a is a brand of Russian vodka, by the way. So, I'm sure you know that. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, so I went to NJDXA. I went up with, met up with my friend Peter W2IRT, and Peter was a, is a big-time DXer, okay? And he introduced me to the world of DXing. Like he said, yeah, DX is a thrill, DX is a chase, you try to. And I got hooked. I ended up getting um, on mobile, um, you know, put a radio in the car and, you know, the Honda and just tool around New York City. So um, let me explain to you some, some things you could try to, uh, to explore. Hey, Paul, how's it going? Nice to see you here um, from the lab, huh? You know, I saw that swanky new station you guys have there. Um, that's pretty nice. I'm, I'm really glad to see that. I'm hoping to see that in some YouTube videos you guys produce. So, um, yeah, so some things you can try to explore, all right? Now let me explain some things. So I had to tell, I had to give you guys a little context, okay? So I think pretty much a lot of people are coming into ham radio now for the Baofeng, okay? Because the Baofeng is an easy way to get in. And that's cool, but I tell people, you know, go beyond the Baofeng. The first thing I would really try, first of all, is um, you might figure out um, that... Um, repeaters are pretty much where you want to be well you know what in trinidad and tobago we had simplex communication being emphasized as an important disaster preparedness track what does this mean it means that in a true disaster you might have hurricanes that will wipe out the repeaters and one problem we're having now in trinidad is that the access road to those repeaters and transmitters are becoming impassable due to vegetation growth and landslides even the biggest baddest four by four with offset wheels and lifted 50 inches yeah i know that's that you know not you know it lifted real high and um stuff can't go up to the hills anymore <laughs> you know so you might find that people might park somewhere and walk and hike up the hill which is not sustainable when you have big equipment to carry up there or you might have to take a helicopter so Point being that the repeater will go down, okay? You will absolutely have situations where the repeater goes down. And then um, the, 
the thing you got to do is you have to make sure that you have good simplex capability. So it might mean setting up an antenna outside your house. And it could be something like a, um, maybe I'll bring up the web browser here and show you like a, um, a diamond X50 or something like that. But a good antenna I got introduced to early on was a Slim Jim. Okay. And a Slim Jim antenna. I know Americans like the J-Pole antenna, but the Slim Jim was a little different. And um, I will show you this. Okay. Mm, with the web browser. Web browser. Web browser. Uh, Google Chrome. Slim Jim antenna project. Okay. And i got to make that a little bigger. Transition. Voila. Okay, yeah. So the Slim Jim basically is a folded um, uh, omnidirectional antenna, a folded dipole, and has considerable gain. Now, um, it actually, the, the real interesting thing about Slim Jim is that the radiation is almost parallel toward the ground. So it is very much more efficient than a ground plane, right? And... Um, is very popular on two meters. The 11 meter operators, right? Because you have a lot of um, 11 meter operators in Trinidad actually got involved, <laughs> you know, they got involved in ham radio, but they still stay on 11. They use a Slim Jim too, you know? And uh, yeah, so that's one thing you could, you could get into, you know, build a simple antenna. And I build it so cheap. I took some PVC pipe and I took some wire and I actually did a shortcut. Instead of putting it in the, the pipe, I just drilled through and just wired it up, hooked it up real cheap. So, um, uh, King of Jersey. Oh, cool. Yeah, nice, nice, yeah. So, um, Jim, yeah, so Jim, let me tell you something. I, I put, I, I made public those videos where, um, where Eric was operating. So, you know, you can take a look at that. So that's real cool. So simplex is one thing. And then you might find yourself, well, you know, maybe I got an all mode radio. Maybe I got an ICOM 705, okay, which I have too, which can do two meter single sideband, okay? So you can get on two meter single sideband. And you find yourself now figuring, well, you know, I want to make further contacts, but wait, those are horizontally polarized. So what do I need? What, what can I get? So you might find yourself getting a beam antenna. And then you might find yourself tra chasing grid squares and getting a little more into the addiction now. You see, so it's kind of snowballing. Or you might take a different direction. You might figure, well, you know, I want to work satellites, right? So when you, um, you know, like I said, you know, you could start off small and you go into different things. The point is that if you keep with one activity, I actually had, a, I, I went to a club luncheon yesterday there's some people who do it fine, okay? There was this guy there sitting at the table. The New Providence Amateur Radio Club was the club luncheon I went to yesterday. And um, I have to go to a lot of these things in the in December. I don't mind. I love I love hanging out with radio clubs, you know, just because um, I like seeing what they do and um, generally keeping up with them. So, um, yeah, the, the New Providence Club, one of the guys at my table was saying, well, you know, I've never done anything in ham radio except repeaters. I've never even done simplex. I was taken back. Wow. Okay. And he said, yeah, but, you know, I just have all my friends on a repeater, so it's no big deal. I was, I was like, okay. So I, I figured that's kind of strange, but um, some people do that, you know. But um, there are some people who figure, well, you know, I get on a re repeater. Nobody wants to talk to me. So why don't you try something different, you know. Or maybe I've, I've you know, the repeater is old hat. Maybe I try something different. As a technician, if you're a technician, you have so many privileges you can try. You can try the 2-meter sideband or 2-meter CW or even 2-meter FT8, right, which is the digital modes. You could go down to 6 meters, which has occasional DX. You might find yourself wanting some more after that. So you could probably go down to 10 and then... Um, Yep, ham radio is a spread spectrum hobby, even though spread spectrum is not, not legal on lower bands. So, you know, you, you find it snowballing from there. 
But let me give you some ideas of some things, interesting niches to try in ham radio, okay? One of them, of course, is um, the regular contesting DXing. Even if you're not a contester, right? If during the contest, you can find yourself talking to all sorts of stations. Now, you wouldn't be able to, to have a whole conversation with them, and some people get upset at that. You know, they say, well, I want to have a conversation on the radio. Well, maybe not, that's not for you. But if you want to make contacts and you want to collect QSL cards and stuff, you could try the contest because a lot of stations get on during the contest. A lot of rare stations that get on. Here's a little secret too, okay? During the contest is fine, but you know what happens too? A lot of these guys, they travel, right? And they travel and they're there a week. Some of them a week, they're doing the station maintenance on a faraway station a week before the contest. So, yeah, so you got to figure out, well, you know what? Maybe um, I'm going to work them during that week when they're testing things out. And you know what? You might get not only less competition than the contest pileups, but you might also find that you'll probably get different call signs. So, you know, if you're chasing prefixes and stuff, you might work different call signs. So um, it's one thing to try. But you know what? You might get bored with that. Even within HF, you know, some people, they go on 20 meters and they stay on 20 meters. I was stuck on 20 meters for a long time. Try the other bands, you know. Try 40 meters. So 40 meters is, you know, um, I, they say 40 is the new 20, and that even applies to ham radio. You might become, you know, you might become acquainted with the other bands and you chase the DX on the other bands. Some people think once they get their 100 countries and DXCC award that they're good to go. Let me tell you, my friends, it goes way beyond that, okay? Not only number of countries, but also bands and modes work. So once you're done with that, and then, you know, I get a little burnt out on DX sometimes in contesting. I try the digital modes, okay? I try like PSK31, keyboard chat, even though there's a lot less of that these days. I try... The FT8, actually, I was a very early adopter of FT8, having done JT65 a while. And um, speaking of FT8, you know, we lost uh, one of the, the members of the FT8, the WSJT development team, Bill Somerville. And Bill, Bill, was a real, Bill was a real gentleman. Bill used to go on the mailing list and answer questions and such. And Bill actually was responsible for a lot of the, um, the, the front end um, graphical user interface. It was written in a language called Qt, which is spelled capital Q, lowercase t. So it was written in Qt. And Bill was the, the guy behind that. So those activities, okay? And then beyond that, you know, you might find yourself, well, you know, maybe I want a new challenge, you know? Satellites is one, like I mentioned. Um, you used to make contact with the space station with astronauts and the space station at random, but now they ha they just have so much science work to do. They're actually reserving the astronaut talking time for the uh, the students in schools. And I'm actually helping out with a contact in February sometime um, at a local charter school. Beyond that, um, you know, you could try image communication. There are several ways to do image communication meaning you're sending pictures, you could do analog slow scan TV. And despite the fact that you do it with a sound card and a computer, it is analog. There is digital slow scan TV as well, which uses a software called EasyPal, right? EasyPal. And uh, <laughs> I think that was the thing. And uh, yeah, you know, yeah, i sorry I didn't mention Joel. Um, Joel, Joel was a real nice guy, you know. If you look, I put out a community post a couple days ago with Joel where Sean Kutzko, K KX9X, was interviewing him at um, Dayton, you know. And uh, Joel, if, you, if you've if never listened to the AWRL, and the AWRL podcasts are free, by the way, right? There's a podcast called The Doctor Is In, and Joel Hallis was the contributing editor, and he used to answer a lot of technical um, questions on there. So, yeah. So, anyway... Um, so yeah, so you might you might figure that, you know, you do image communications with software called EasyPal. Or you might figure that, well, you know what? Um, I want to try, you know, using, I want to try sending email over amateur radio. Okay, 
do you know that there was one more more than one option to do it right there's there's winlink of course which is like the you know the major player there used to be i think there still is a software called psk mail um i don't know if they're still doing it um but used to be able to do um um oh it's still there okay i don't know if it's working but you could use it with um i think it's like a wrapper for fl digi and yeah i'll bring it up here but you know it of course um let me tell you anything but winlink is going to be less than an optimal experience right because these things are more experimental than anything so yeah psk mail and they use basically the little signal of psk 31 the only problem is they don't have the robust error correction and such like that. Um, but actually, no, they might have because they have ARQ and stuff. You know, these FL Digi and these PSK, MFSK, and Thor modes. Ooh, okay. They have soft Viterbi decoding and interleave. Nice. Okay. Good stuff. See, I didn't know that. Okay. Nice. Good stuff. Uh... Yeah, so on VHF, right? Um, you can do it on APRS, Appers. Um, APRS is uh, pretty interesting. I give um, demos sometimes to scouting groups, and I show them. I said, so what I do is I say, this is my cell phone, and then I put away. I say, we don't need this, okay? And then I take out my phone, I take out my radio, my Kenwood D74, which is somewhere here, I think. Um, yeah, Sans antenna, but it's here. And then I fire it up and say, watch this drive. <laughs> yeah, that's a George Bush reference. But um, I type out a text message. But you know, this is kind of... I wish they've had a full keyboard for this, though. And so, like, you're typing. This is worse than T9. Anybody remember T9 from uh, cell phone days? So, anyway, um, I type out a text message and send it. And within, like, maybe, like, 10, 15 seconds, they get the text message on, a, on somebody else's cell phone. Really interesting stuff, you know? So, yeah, so that's a, that's a good one. Um, let's see. What frequency does that use? Does the PSK mail? Um, that's a good question. I know somebody, I never really use it. Um, I know some people who um, did it. I'll have to take a, a look and see. Uh-oh. I think they might have might have shut down, to be honest. But um, might have been within the PSK window. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, T9 was, was good stuff. Um, whoopsie daisy. Okay. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but you notice um, I put out a, a message, a, a video the other day, a couple days ago, about clubs, right? And one comment that was made by somebody local, by the way, um, Joe Capano, NE2Z, um, he was saying basically that general interest clubs are kind of dying off, which I believe to be kind of true that, you know, general interest amateur radio clubs are seeing declines. I, there are some of them that actually thrive, right? Like Fairlawn Amateur Radio Club in New Jersey. Um, they're seeing membership declines like everybody else, but they're actually seeing some growth in a lot of things. You know, they have their co coffee talks, right? You got to say like Joey Z, coffee talk. So they have their coffee talks, and then they, which are, which are basically like Zoom meetings with um, different guest speakers, and they air them on YouTube. If you have a chance, check out their YouTube channel. Uh, their YouTube channel is called FairLoanArc.org. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I said, PSK Mail is probably dead now. You know, most everybody's using WinLink and. You know, the advent of Vara and all of that stuff, I don't think anybody really needs anything else. So, um, yeah. 
So beyond that, I mean, you know, the the general interest clubs, like I said, are kind of dying off. Then you have the specialist clubs that are dealing with DXing, contesting, digital modes, um, youth. Um, I don't think there's, well, there's some youth clubs, you know, and youth activities and such like that. They seem to be thriving. I mean, not, not just youth, but I mean, like, you know, specialized interest clubs. It's kind of like YouTube. So, you know, I, I actually take deep dive into YouTube analytics and stuff like that. And what I was told is that having a quote unquote variety channel where you post about everything and anything and you don't care about niching down, you can have, um, you don't really have, um, you know, you're not really going to be successful and grow because then your audience really doesn't know what to expect from you. So you might have fewer people subscribing. So, you know, if you niche down and you do one topic per channel, you have a better chance of, um, of growing a channel. Same thing with, with radio clubs, I think, is happening. You know, same thing with everything. I remember when TV was, you know, all the TV stations had, like, all different kind of shows. And then um, you found that with the advent of cable TV, uh, you had the super stations like TBS and all that stuff. But then, you know, you find that um, <laughs> the, the niche channels, like, I remember CNN, of course, when CNN was actually owned by Ted Turner. Um, CNN is trash now. Um, Fox News is trash too. I worked there for so long, but um, <laughs> I don't like cable news. Okay, I find they're fear mongers, and they they love to push the the views. But um, they specialize now, and you have like Home and Garden TV, you have Cartoon Network, you have Sci Fi Channel. I remember I received Sci Fi Channel on C band. You know, one of my friends had a C band dish, and we had Sci Fi Channel on C band. So, um, so, <laughs> uh, I think that was my son, but you know, so I might've been one of the girls probably <laughs> Yeah, came down to, to go and do stuff. Right. So anyway, um, right. So like I said, you know, there's always stuff to do. I want to cover some of these in depth sometime, you know, different specific topics, I mean, if there's anything you would like to see specifically covered, I can always um, do it. I have a, a wide variety of things I've done in amateur radio, and I, I can really cover them all in one live stream. Um, so let me see what else is here. Um, I love CW. I operate SSB occasionally. Oh, yeah, you know, I used to be a strictly phone operator. I did learn CW to get my license, right? Because back then, you kind of had to, ha to know CW to get an HF license. In the United States, it was five words a minute after April 15, 2000, and I, I arrived here at the end of the year 2000. So I came in after that. In Trinidad, it was 12 words a minute. I got it. I, you know, I passed it there. Um, but after that, I kind of just, you know, I worked a little bit on Morse code. But then I fell back into phone. I actually learned um, CW again. And I did some, I it re, I really only pushed to do CW when I realized a lot of DX was working CW. And you know, a lot of um, foreign stations were working CW. So I was doing DXing and then, you know, I said, hmm, maybe I should learn a little more. Incidentally, um, there are two great, there are two of many great resources. Two of them that generally get passed around the internet are the CW Ops group. And they have, they sponsor the CW Ops T. The tests that run, I believe, every Wednesdays, is it? And they have the uh, the Long Island CW Club. Great bunch of guys. They teach clubs on Zoom. So anyway, all right. Well, look, I don't want to keep this more than an hour. Um, anyone coming to Orlando? I will be in Orlando. And um, I'm going to be part of the AWRL contingent at Orlando. So... That means I'll probably be seeing Paul <laughs> if he's there. Paul, if you're, uh, you know, if you're going to Orlando, let me know. You know, we got to hang out. And um, let's see, uh, who else? Um, I'm going to Dayton. But Orlando actually is the AWRL National Convention, which is kind of interesting. Because we voted on this in 2019. I, um, you know, the motion was then... Um, uh, made by then director Greg Surratt, W4OZK, OZK, or whatever. And um, we were supposed to have it in 
2021. No, not 20, in 2020. Right? So that gives um, Orlando, you know, the, the Hamcation Committee enough time to plan. And then I just, you know, of course, the, the virus came along. And that was the end of that. And then we pushed it ahead a year. You know? So, um, you know. But it'll be nice to see everybody down there. My mom lives in the area. So I, I'll probably go see her. My cousins live right near to the fairground. So I'll probably be seeing them too. So anyway, all right, guys. Well, look, enjoy the rest of the week. I'm going to be posting videos all week, hopefully, on various things. If you want to see some, let me know, okay? I do have some tech reviews and stuff. Oh, I'll show you one thing. I'm going to actually... Um, now, there is one thing I want to show you guys that I, that I will have a full review on. Um, the Aramax... Smart electric screwdriver. I just saw this on Kickstarter and I figured, hey, you know what? I gotta have it. All right? It comes in this nice little case here. And then it comes out. And a screwdriver comes out. You see here? And you put a tip in it. It's all magnetic. Alright? And then you push it in. And then you press. And then you turn. And it would spin. And you turn the other way. And it would spin the other way. And the torque is adjusted by the the amount of time space you turn. That's four LEDs, you know. They call it shadowless LEDs, so it's not going to cast a shadow. So that'll be interesting. Um, uh, yeah, I have a full review video on this coming on. All right, everybody, thank you very much for watching. All of you, be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Seventy-three.